Indian National Archive. Among these files are materials from the Security Police and the Ministry of Internal Affairs. The materials that pertain to the deportations are also to be found here. This had many thought-out objectives. One of them was to destroy the farms of Estonia, because that was where the Estonian salt of the earth came from. Obviously, if left untouched, the Russians wouldn't have been able to sow the seeds of their mentality here. Besides, the farms provided for and helped those who were in the woods. The main task for Soviet Estonian peasants now is to gather the rich harvest on time and without losses. Threshing machines are performing their task in all villages so that the threshing can be quickly completed and the debt of honor to the state can be paid. Peasants from the No rural district in Tartuma went so far as to organize what they call a red transport of grain in order to fulfill their promise to comrade Stalin to quickly attain their target norm of grain production. Party propaganda didn't initially reveal its plan for collectivization. The signal from Moscow came in May 1947. Massive collectivization was carried out in spring of 1949 in all of the western parts of the Soviet Union, but it was preceded by another huge wave of deportations. Estonian resistance fighters thought that they wouldn't be affected. Actually, after the deportations, many more people took refuge in the woods, joined guerrilla groups, and started to exact revenge for the deportations. I remember a chairman of a kolhos who came to our meeting barefooted. His trousers were rolled up. He was bearing an automatic weapon. He came to talk with us. At five in the morning they banged on our door with their rifle butts and a big group of men entered. They bore nothing to indicate their rank which was characteristic of the NKVD. They wore soldiers' greatcoats and sharp pointed hats. They were leaders. There was an Estonian woman with them, one I didn't know. She read the decree to my grandmother, informing her that she had been sentenced to exile. The neighbor woman came, crying and asking if we had any bread. Their family was being taken away. Could we give them some bread to take on the journey? We gave her bread and thought, what will happen next? We were afraid, but they didn't come after us. On that day, all the phones were out of order. We didn't understand why, but then we saw those cars, with all the deported people in them. The most depressing thing was that they read to you that you were receiving a life sentence, that if you tried to escape you would get 25 years at hard labor, that you had no right to choose jobs or a profession. The only thing that awaited you was hard physical work. This is repression of the worst kind. Before the mass deportations, 8% of Estonian farms were collectivized. In a month's time, that figure had leapt up to 64%. State norms and tractor stations swallowed up most of the crops that the newly established collective farms were capable of producing. Work in kolhoses lost its meaning, and the kolhosniks lost their work habits. A huge campaign of joining the collective farms began. Everybody applied because they were afraid of being deported. I remember when I came home from Sakati, I met my mother, and she had our cow on a line with her. There's a dairy farm nearby. I asked, why are you taking our cow there? And she answered, my grandfather, her father, Daniel Rom, had said that we must always do as the state orders.
According to the research I've done, the lowest salary paid in a kolhoz was 4 kopecks and 90 grams of straw a day. That amounts to a yearly salary of 12 rubles and 90 kilos of straw. In one article I wrote that the kolhoznik's salary was just big enough that he could order the district newspaper Haryuelu and read about how well the kolhozniks were living. Yes, the campaigns and slogans. An example. They demanded from us, school teachers, that there have to be slogans in schools and other places, even in barns. Teachers were on all fours on the floor of the hall drawing slogans. It was so hard to believe all of what had happened. I loved Estonia so much. When my father listened to the voice of America, my mother was so afraid that someone might find out. And then... We had a big Estonian flag. Lots of searches were being carried out, so we cut the flag into three parts. The white segment was in one place, the blue was used as a tablecloth, and the black was in a third place. The small flag for display on the table was also hidden, but on Independence Day we would take it out. We were very disappointed in the West. We listened to the radio stations and waited for the white ship to come. We truly believed in it. The neighbor boys had a little radio and we listened, hoping that the white ship will come. What came instead were the deportations. No one came. It felt like betrayal. Hope was lost. Comrades, let's lift a toast to the best friend of the Estonian people. He who provided the Estonian peasants with the chance to join the Kolhoses and therefore to develop culturally. To Comrade Stalin's health. Many things changed during the five post-war years. Soviet power had arrested tens of thousands of people. In 1945 there were about 2,400 members in the Communist Party. A year later there were over 7,000. In 1950, repression of the so-called bourgeois nationalists was introduced in cultural life, and the white ship was nowhere to be seen.